yes, that was it. Hi. Okay. Um, I think I just turned up the volume. I think I'm live. Are we live? It feels live. Are we on? It says I'm live. Okay, so it's it's that time again. And um, hi, it's Allison Arngram in my living room once more. And oh, oh, there's little things. Okay, there you are. Good. Okay, you can hear me? Everybody can hear me? Good. Um, so I read um, chapter one of Little House in the Big Woods yesterday. And it was incredibly awesome. Um, and I'm going to go to chapter two. And I, I might go to three. I might go to three. Don't know. Everything. Um, I'm ready. I, I like. I have a cup of tea. I'm like set. Um, heard from people. Heard from people. We have uh, England. Uh, we, of course, France. Uh, bonjour. Uh, je vous aime. All, lots, all my friends. Uh, also, I saw that, like Sweden and Isle of Malta were apparently watching. I Malta. I do, who knows? Anyway, there everybody's watching. That's great. And so I might go a teeny bit earlier in the day tomorrow and Monday. Don't know. I don't know. Maybe twelve one because it's really late in Europe, and some people like want to watch it live and not stay up too late. So we'll see. We'll see. I'll give you a time tomorrow. It'll be fine. All right. So we're gonna read the last in the big woods. We're gonna read all books. We're gonna do them all. And um, chapter two is winter days and winter nights. So, because you know I'm wearing the bonnet. I said I'd wear the bonnet. I'm wearing the bonnet. Oh, the red really, really rocks with the yellow, right? New Jersey. New Jersey's on the line. That's good. 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 Oh, got to have a bow. Okay. There's a lot of um, bears and pigs and killing and skinning things in this chapter as well. So, it's lovely. <laughs> chapter two. Winter days and winter nights. The first snow came and the bitter cold. Every morning, Pa took his gun and his traps and was gone all day in the big woods, setting the small traps for the muskrats and mink, mink, mink along the creeks and middle-sized traps for foxes and wolves in the woods. He set out the big bear traps, hoping to get a fat bear before they all went into their dens for the winter. One morning, he came back took the horses in the sled and hurried away again. He had shot a bear. Laura and Mary jumped up and down and clapped their hands. They were so glad. Mary shouted, I want the drumstick. I want the drums. Do bears have drumsticks? I mean, what, what, what am I even reading here? I want the drumstick. <clears throat> Mary did not know how big a bear's drumstick was. <clears throat> I don't think you really call it a drumstick on a bear. And it would be, it would be enormous. And there's, there was Pa <clears throat> shooting a bear. When Pa came back, he had both a bear and a pig in the wagon. He had been going through the woods with a big bear trap in his hands and the gun on his shoulder when he walked around a big pine tree covered with snow and the bear was behind the tree. The bear had just killed a pig and was picking it up to eat it. Pa said the bear was standing up on its hind legs, holding the pig in its paws, just as though they were hands. Arr, arr. Pa shot the bear, and there was no way of knowing where the pig came from, nor whose pig it was. So, I just brought home the bacon, Pa said. Okay, 1875, literally the first dad joke. There was plenty of fresh meat to last for a long time. The days and the nights were so cold that the pork, they put the pork in, ooh, so cold that the pork in a box and the bear meat hanging in a little shed outside the back door were solidly frozen and did not thaw. When Ma wanted fresh meat for dinner, Pa took the axe and cut off a chunk of frozen bear meat or pork. But the sausage balls or the salt pork or the smoked hams and the venison, Ma could get for herself from the shed or the attic. The snow kept coming till it was drifted and banked against the house. In the mornings, the window panes were covered with frost in beautiful pictures of trees and flowers and fairies. Ma said that Jack Frost came in the night and made the pictures while everyone was asleep. Laura thought that Jack Frost was a little man, all snowy white, wearing a glittering white pointed cap and soft white knee boots made of deer skin. His coat was white, and his mittens were white, and he did not carry a gun on his back, but in his hands he had shining, sharp tools with which he carved the pictures. Laura and Mary were allowed to take Ma's thimble and make pretty patterns of circles in the frost on the glass, but they never spoiled the pictures that Jack Frost had made in the night. 
When they put their mouths close to the pane and blew their breath on it, the white frost melted and ran in drops down the glass. Then they could see the drifts of snow outside and the great trees standing bare and black, making thin blue shadows on the white snow. Laura and Mary helped them all with the work. Every morning there were dishes to wipe. Mary wiped most of them. Then Laura, because she was, but then Laura, she was bigger. But Laura always wiped carefully her own little cup and plate. By the time the dishes were all wiped and set away, the trundle bed was there. Oh, oh, picture, picture, picture of Laura Mary making the trundle bed. Oh, look. Then, <clears throat> standing one on each side, Laura and Mary straightened the covers, tucked them in well at the foot and sides, <clears throat> plumped up the pillows, and put them in place. Then Ma pushed the trundle bed into its place under the big bed. Oh, it was one of those pull-out things, like a couch thing. <clears throat> After this was done, <clears throat> Ma began the work that belonged to that day. Oh, this is good, this is good. Each day had its own proper work. Ma used to say, wash on Monday, iron on Tuesday, mend on Wednesday, churn on Thursday, clean on Friday, bake on Saturday, and rest on Sunday. The schedule thing going on. Okay, it's Saturday, we could bake. Laura liked the churning and the baking days best of all the week. Okay, I totally agree. In winter... The cream was not yellow as it was in the summer, and butter churned from it was white and not so pretty. Ma liked everything on her table to be pretty, so in the winter time she colored the butter. Very clever. After she had put the cream in the tall crockery churn and set it near the stove to warm, oh good, we're getting butter churning, the butter churning is happening. Okay, set it to warm, she washed and scraped a long orange colored carrot. Then she grated it on the bottom of the old leaky tin pan that Pa had punched full of nail holes for her. Homemade, homemade grater. Ma rubbed the carrot across the roughness until she had rubbed it all through the holes, and when she lifted up the pan, there was a soft, juicy mound of grated carrot. She put this in a little pan of milk on the stove, and when the milk was hot, she poured milk and carrot into a cloth bag. Then she squeezed the bright yellow milk into the churn where it colored all the cream. Now the butter would be yellow. Did you know that Laura was eating a bunch of carrot flavored butter? That that was a thing I, I had. Yeah. Laura and Mary were allowed to eat the carrot after the milk had been squeezed out. Mary thought she ought to have the larger share because she was older. And Laura said she should have it because she was littler. But Ma said they must divide it evenly. It was very good. When the cream was ready, Ma scalded the long wooden churn dash, got to clean, got to keep it clean, and put it in the churn and dropped the wooden churn cover over it. Okay, the butter churn, butter churn, butter churn, Laura. Uh, okay, the churn cover had a little round hole in the middle, and Ma moved the dash up and down, up and down through the hole. She churned for a long time. Mary could sometimes churn while Ma rested, but the dash was too heavy for Laura. At first, the splashes of cream showed thick and smooth around the little hole. After a long time, they began to look grainy. Then, Ma churned more slowly, and on the dash, there began to appear tiny grains of yellow butter. When Ma took off the churn cover, there was the butter in a golden lump, drowning in the buttermilk. Oh, that's starting to sound kind of good. Actually, churning butter doesn't take that long, but there you go. Then Ma took out the lump with a wooden paddle into a wooden bowl, and she washed it many times in cold water, turning it over and over and working it with the paddle until the water ran clear. After that, she salted it, <laughs> because the salt again, they're, they're salting, they're constantly salting things in this. Now came the best part of the churning. Ma molded the butter. On the loose bottom of the wooden butter mold was carved the picture of a strawberry with two strawberry leaves. With the paddle, Ma packed butter tightly into the mold until it was full. Then she turned it upside down over a plate and pushed on the handle of the loose bottom. The little firm pat of golden butter came out with the strawberry and its leaves molded on top. Laura and Mary watched breathless one on each side of Ma while the golden little butter pats, each with its strawberry on the top, dropped onto the plate as Ma put all the butter through the mold. Then Ma gave them each a drink of good, fresh buttermilk. Mm. Okay, we're going to have to have, like, snacks during this thing. 
On Saturdays, when Ma made the bread, they each had a little piece of dough to make into a little loaf. They might have a bit of cookie dough, too, to make little cookies. And once Laura even made a pie in her patty pan. Okay, they said cookies, so it's because I have snacks. After the day's work was done, Ma sometimes cut paper dolls for them. She cut the dolls out of stiff white paper and drew the faces with a pencil. Then, from bits of colored paper, she cut dresses and hats, ribbons and laces, so that Laura and Mary could dress their dolls beautifully. But the best time of all was at night when Pa came home. He would come in from his tramping through the snowy woods with tiny icicles hanging on the ends of his mustaches. Mustaches? Mustaches, plural. He would hang his gun on the wall over the door, throw off his fur cap and coat and mittens, and call, Where's my little half pint of sweet cider, half drunk up? That was Laura, because she was so small. Laura and Mary would run to climb on his knees and sit there while he warmed himself by the fire. Then he would put on his coat and cap and mittens again and go out to do the chores and bring in plenty of wood for the fire. Sometimes, when Pa had walked his trap lines quickly because the traps were empty, or when he had got some games sooner than usual, he would come home early. Then he would have time to play with Laura and Mary. One game, <laughs> one game they loved was called Mad Dog. Pa would run his fingers through his thick brown hair, standing it all up on end. Then he dropped on all fours and growling, chased Laura and Mary all around the room, trying to get them cornered where they couldn't get away. Rawr! Yes, here, seriously, this is, this is, a, this is the game. Rawr, 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 they chased them into the corner. One game they loved was called Mad Dog. Indeed, chased them into the corner. And they couldn't get away, and, but they were very quick. They were quick at dodging and running. But once he caught them against the wood box behind the stove, they couldn't get past Pa, and there was no other way out. Then Pa growled so terribly, his hair was so wild, and his eyes so fierce, that it all seemed real. Mary was so frightened that she could not move. But Pa came near, Laura screamed, and with a wild leap and a scramble, she went over the wood box, dragging Mary with her. And at once, there was no mad dog at all. There was only Pa, standing there with his blue eyes shining, looking at Laura. Well, he said to her, you're only a little half pint of cider, half drunk up. But by jinx, you're as strong as a little French horse. You shouldn't frighten the children so, Charles, Ma said. Look how big their eyes are. Pa looked, and then he took down the fiddle. He began to play and sing. And he, he sings Yankee Doodle. Okay, Yankee Doodle. Uh, this is like verses of Yankee Doodle I have never heard. Okay. Yankee Doodle went to town. He wore his striped trousers. He swore he couldn't see the town. There was so many houses. Laura and Mary forgot all about the mad dog. And there he saw some great big guns, big as a log of maple. And every time they turned him round, it took two yoke of cattle. And that doesn't rhyme. I don't understand. And every time they fired him off, it took a horn of powder. It made a noise like father's gun, only a nation louder. Pa was keeping time with his foot. And Laura clapped her hands to the music when he sang. And I'll sing Yankee doodle dee doo. And I'll sing Yankee doodle. And I'll sing Yankee doodle dee doo. And I'll sing Yankee doodle. <laughs> All alone in the wild big woods. And the snow and the cold. The little log house was warm and snug and cozy. Pa and Ma and Mary and Laura and baby Carrie were comfortable and happy there, especially at night. Then the fire was shining on the hearth, and the cold and the dark and the wild beasts were all shut out, and Jack the Brindle Bulldog and Black Susan the Cat lay blinking at the flames in the fireplace. Ma sat in her rocking chair, sewing by the light of the lamp on the table. The lamp was bright and shiny. There was salt in the bottom of its glass bowl with the kerosene to keep the kerosene from exploding. Ah! The kerosene! Because <laughs> your lamp can blow up. And again, salt, because... Salt. There was salt in everything. Okay, the salt from and and among she put flannel. She put little bits of red flannel among the salt to make it pretty. It was pretty. <clears throat> Laura loved to look at the lamp with its glass chimney so clean and sparkling, its yellow flame burning so steadily, and its bowl of clear kerosene colored red by the bits of flannel. 
She loved to look at the fire in the fireplace, flickering and changing all the time, burning yellow and red, and sometimes green above the logs, and hovering blue over the golden and ruby coals. And then, Pa told stories. When Laura and Mary begged him for a story, he would take them on his knees and tickle their faces with his long whiskers until they laughed aloud. His eyes were blue and merry. One night, Pa looked at Black Susan, stretching herself before the fire and running her claws out and in, and he said, Do you know that a panther is a cat, a great big wild cat? No, said Laura. Well, it is, said Pa. Just imagine Black Susan, bigger than Jack and fiercer than Jack when he growls. Then she would be just like a panther. He settled Laura and Mary more comfortably on his knees, and he said, I'll tell you about Grandpa and the panther. Your grandpa, Laura asked. No, Laura, your grandpa, my father. Oh, Laura said, and she wriggled closer against Pa's arm. She knew her grandpa. He lived far away in the big woods in a big log house. Pa began. The story of Grandpa and, and there's a panther, there's a panther up on the bridge. Story of Grandpa and the Panther. Your grandpa went to town one day and was late starting home. It was dark when he came riding his horse through the big woods, so dark that he could hardly see the road. And when he heard a panther scream, he was frightened, for he had no gun. How does a panther scream? Laura asked. Like a woman, said Pa, like this. Then he screamed, so Laura and Mary shivered with terror. Ma jumped in her chair and said, Mercy, Charles! But Laura and Mary loved to be scared like that. The horse with Grandpa on him ran fast, for it was frightened too. But it could not get away from the panther. The panther followed through the dark woods. It was a hungry panther. And it came as fast as the horse could run. It screamed now on this side of the road, now on the other side, and it was always close behind. Grandpa leaned forward in the saddle and urged the horse to run faster. The horse was running as fast as it could possibly run, and still the panther screamed close behind. Then Grandpa caught a glimpse of it as it leaped from treetop to treetop almost overhead. It was a huge black panther leaping through the air like Black Susan leaping on a mouse. It was many, many times bigger than Black Susan. It was so big that if it leapt on Grandpa, it could kill him with his enormous slashing claws and its long, sharp teeth. Grandpa, on his horse, was running away from it just as a mouse runs from a cat. The panther did not scream any more. Grandpa did not see it any more, but he knew that it was coming, leaping after him in the dark woods behind him. The horse ran with all its might. At last, the horse ran up to Grandpa's house. Grandpa saw the panther springing. Grandpa jumped off the horse against the door. He burst through the door and slammed it behind him. The panther landed on the horse's back, just to where Grandpa had been. The horse screamed terribly and ran. He was running away into the big woods with the panther riding on his back and ripping his back with its claws. But Grandpa grabbed his gun from the wall and got to the window, just in time to shoot Grandpa said he would never again go into the big woods without his gun. His panther, panther attacking Grandpa on horse. When Pa told this story, Laura and Mary shivered and snuggled closer to him. They were safe and snug on his knees with his strong arms around them. They liked to be there before the warm fire with Black Susan purring on the hearth and good dog Jack stretched out beside her. When they heard a wolf howl, Jack's head lifted and the hairs rose stiff along his back. But Laura and Mary listened to that lonely sound in the dark and the cold of the big woods, and they were not afraid. They were cozy and comfortable in their little house made of logs, with the snow drifted around it and the wind crying because it could not get in by the fire. So that's, that's chapter two. But, hey, let's do... Chapter three, it is. Chapter, we're just going to do it. We're going to do chapter three because that was scary. So let's, oh, <laughs> chapter three is just going to be more terrifying because it's actually called the long rifle. So it's probably more shooting of animals and panthers eating people and God knows what. So the long rifle. Every evening before he began to tell stories, Pa made the bullets for the next day's hunting. He had to make them himself. He had to make his own bullets. Laura and Mary helped him. They brought the big, long-handled spoon and the box full of bits of lead and the bullet mold. 
Then, while he squatted on the hearth and made the bullets, they sat one on each side of him and watched. First, he melted the bits of lead in the big spoon held in the coals. When the lead was melted, he poured it carefully, I'll bet, carefully from the spoon into the little hole in the bullet mold. He waited a minute, and then he opened the mold and out dropped a bright new bullet onto the hearth. The bullet was too hot to touch, but it shone so temptingly that sometimes Laura or Mary could not help touching it. Then they burned their fingers. But they did not say anything because Pa had told them never to touch a new bullet. If they burned their fingers, that was their own fault. They should have minded him. So they put their fingers in their mouths to cool them and watched Pa make more bullet. Ow, 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 I touched a bullet, ow. There would be a shining pile of them on the hearth before Pa stopped. He let them cool. Then with his jackknife, he trimmed off the little lumps left by the hole in the mold. He gathered up the tiny shavings of lead and saved them carefully to melt again the next time he made bullets. The finished bullets he put into his bullet pouch. This was a little bag which Ma had made beautifully of buckskin from a buck Pa had shot. With the bullets that he made into the bag. Circular, the bullets go in the bag, the buckskin that you shoot with the bullets and it all makes total sense. After the bullets were made, Pa would take his gun down from the wall and clean it. Out in the snowy woods all day, it might have gathered a little dampness, and the inside of the barrel was sure to be dirty from powder smoke. So Pa would take the ramrod from its place under the gun barrel and fasten a piece of clean cloth on its end. Okay. Gun cleaning lessons, everyone! Um, he stood the butt of the gun in a pan on the hearth and poured boiling water from the tea kettle into the gun barrel. I don't know. Is that a good idea? I don't know. Um, then quickly, he dropped the ramrod in and rubbed it up and down, up and down, while the hot water blackened with powder smoke spurted through the little hole on which the cap was placed when the gun was loaded. Ew. Pa kept pouring in more water and washing the gun barrel with the cloth on the ramrod until the water ran out clear. Then the gun was clean. The water must always be boiling, ah, so that the heated steel would dry instantly. See, you can't get, it gets wet. It's a then Pa put a clean grease rag on the ramrod, and while the gun barrel was still hot, he greased it well on the inside. With another clean grease cloth, he rubbed it all over outside until every bit of it was oiled and sleek. After that, he rubbed and polished the gun stock until the wood of it was bright and shining too. Now he was ready to load the gun again, and Laura and Mary must help him. Standing straight and tall, holding the long gun upright on its butt, while Laura and Mary stood on either side of him, Pa said, You watch me now, and tell me if I make a mistake. So they watched very carefully, but he never made a mistake. Laura handed him the smooth, polished cow horn, cow horn, full of gunpowder. The top of the horn was a little metal cap. Pa filled this cap full of the gunpowder and poured the powder down the barrel of the gun cap works as a measuring device. Totally. Then he shook the gun a little and tapped the barrel to be sure that all the powder was together at the bottom. Where's my patch box? He asked then, and Mary gave him the little tin box full of little pieces of grease cloth. Pa laid one of these bits of greasy cloth over the muzzle of the gun. See, there we go. It's gun cleaning. The muzzle of the gun put one of the shiny new bullets on it, and with the ramrod, he pushed the bullet and the cloth down the gun barrel. Then he pounded them tightly against the powder. When he hit them with the ramrod, the ramrod bounced up in the gun barrel and Pa caught it and thrust it down again. He did this for a long time. Next, he put the ramrod back in its place against the gun barrel. Then taking a box of caps from his pocket, he raised the hammer of the gun and slipped one of the little bright caps over the hollow pin that was under the hammer. He let the hammer down slowly and carefully if it came down quickly, bang, the gun would go off. Now the gun was loaded, and Pa laid it on its hooks over the door. See, there's all his gun loading, bullet making, whatnot equipment. When Pa was at home, the gun always lay across these two wooden hooks above the door. Pa had whittled the hooks out of a green stick with his knife and had driven their straight ends deep into holes in the log. The hooked ends curved upward and held the gun securely. The gun was always loaded and always above the door so that Pa could get it quickly and easily any time he needed a gun. Because they were 
in the, the woods with the thing. When Paul went into the big woods, he always made sure that the bullet pouch was full of bullets and that the tin patch box and the box of caps were with it in his pockets. The powder horn and a small sharp hatchet hung at his belt and he carried the gun ready loaded on his shoulder. He always reloaded the gun as soon as he had fired it, for he said he did not want to meet trouble with an empty gun. Okay, true. Whenever he shot at a wild animal, he had to stop and load the gun, measure the powder, put it in, shake it down, put it in the patch and the bullet, pound them down, and then put in a fresh cap under the hammer <gasps> before he could shoot again. When he shot at a bear or a panther, he must kill it with the first shot. Yeah, because that would take three days. A, a wounded bear or panther could kill a man before he had time to load his gun again. But Laura and Mary were never afraid when Paul went alone into the big woods. They knew he could always kill bears and panthers with the first shot. He killed a bear even holding a pig. For After the bullets were made and the gun was loaded, came storytelling time. Tell us about the voice in the woods, Laura would beg him. Pa crinkled up his eyes at her. Oh no, he said. You don't want to hear about the time I was a naughty little boy. Oh yes, we do, we do, Laura and Mary said. And we do, we so do. So Pa began. The story, Pa and the voice in the woods. There's, there's an owl, I think it's an owl. It's like one of those stories. When I was a little boy, not much bigger than Mary. I had to go every afternoon to find the cows in the woods and drive them home. Can you imagine you got cows and they get lost? You had to go get them in the forest? Not in like a field. To go in the woods and get your cows. It's crazy. Um, go get his cows and drive them home. My father told me never to play by the way, but to hurry and bring the cows home before dark because there were bears and wolves and panthers in the woods, as we have just explained at length about the panthers. One day, I started earlier than usual, so I thought I did not need to hurry. There were so many things to see in the woods that I forgot the dark was coming. There were red squirrels in the trees, chipmunks, chipmunks, chipmunks scurrying through the leaves, and little rabbits playing games together in open places. Little rabbits, you know, always have games together before they go to bed. Did you know that? Did you know that the little rabbits, they have games, they have rabbit games. I want a whole chapter on the rabbit games, like for sure. Okay, the rabbit games. I began to play that I was a mighty hunter, stalking the wild animals and the Indians. I played I was fighting the Indians until the woods seemed full of wild men, and then all at once I heard the birds twittering good night. It was dusky in the path and dark in the woods. I knew that I must get the cows home quickly, or it would be black night before they were safe in the barn, and I couldn't find the cows. I listened, but I could not hear their bells. I called, but the cows didn't come. Moo! 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 I was afraid of the dark and the wild beasts, but I dared not go home to my father without the cows. So I ran through the woods, hunting and calling. All the time the shadows were getting thicker and darker, and the woods seemed larger, and the trees and the bushes looked strange. I could not find the cows anywhere. I climbed up hills, looking for them and calling, and I went down into dark ravines, calling and looking. Cow! 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 I, I stopped and listened for the cow bells, and there was not a sound but the rustling of leaves. Then... I heard loud breathing, and I thought a panther was there in the dark behind me. But it was only my own breathing. My bare legs were scratched by the briars, and when I ran through the bushes, their branches struck me. But I kept on looking and calling, Suki! Suki! Suki? Suki? Suki, I guess is the cow. Suki! Suki! I shouted with all my might. Suki! Apparently Suki is, I don't know, the lead cow. I didn't know about the cow being named Suki. Suki! Right over my head, something asked. Who? My hair stood straight on end. Who? Who? The voice said again. And then how I did run. I forgot all about the cows. All I wanted was to get out of that dark woods to get home. The thing in the dark came after me and called again. Who? I ran with all my might. I ran till I couldn't breathe. And still I kept on running. Something grabbed my foot and down I went. Up I jumped and then I ran. Not even a wolf could have caught me. At last, I came out of the dark woods by the barn. There stood all the cows, waiting to be led through the bars. I let them in and then ran to the house. 
My father looked up and said, Young man, what makes you so late? Been playing, by the way? I looked down at my feet, and then I saw that one big toenail had been torn clean off. I had been so scared, I had not felt it hurt till that minute. Ew, ew, he tore an, in, an entire toenail off. I am, I am, I, I'm totally grossed out now, because that, that would really hurt. Pa always stopped telling the story here and waited until Laura said, Go on, Pa, please go on. Well, Pa said. Then your grandpa went into the yard and cut a stout switch. And he came back into the house and gave me a good thrashing so that I would remember to mind him after that. Okay, he tore off his freaking toenail. He's bleeding and his father beat him on top. This is... I mean, cows, okay, you're going to die if you don't keep your cows. But this has really been just terrible. As someone just said, yes, he would likely have been barefoot. He was running barefoot, and he tears off a toenail, and then he gets beaten with a stick. It's not, it's not good. It's not a good day. A big boy, nine years old, is old enough to remember to my... He's nine! He's nine! He sent him out to the woods, unarmed, with bears and panthers to get cows, and, and tore his toenail off. Nine years old. There's a good reason for what I tell you to do, he said, and if you do as you're told, no harm will come to you. Yes, yes, Pa, Laura would say, bouncing up and down on Pa's knee. And then what did he say? He said, if you'd obeyed me as you should, you wouldn't have been out in the big woods after dark, and you wouldn't have been scared by a screech owl. It was an owl. It was an owl. Ooh, ooh, it's the, it was an owl. So that was how um, Pa at nine, was sent alone into the forest uh, with bears and wolves and panthers to go get the cows barefoot, and um, was frightened and tore off a toenail, was bleeding, and still got beaten with a stick, because it was even earlier than Laura's time, and people were awful. Um, and that sounds quite painful. But he was frightened by now, so then it's like funny, because being beat with a stick plus time equals comedy, apparently. Um, so chapter three, four, that was three, we've now done two and three today. Um, and of course, we'll keep this up on the Facebook page. If you missed it or you're in the Isle of Malta and it was too late and you went to bed, you can still watch it. And my bonnet's flopping. Um, so what are we doing tomorrow? Uh, this is perfect because tomorrow is Sunday and tomorrow is chapter four, Christmas. We're doing the chapter called Christmas. It's going to be Christmas in the big woods tomorrow. Perhaps I will. Ha I should have some Christmas decorations. I have some. I have some cookies and some tea here. Perhaps I should have a Christmas-themed treat of some kind. I don't know. I may go a little earlier. We're doing it three. Maybe tomorrow we'll do it at um, two or one or something. I'm just thinking of Europeans staying up late. Um, but I will put it up exactly what time it is if I go any earlier, and we will do Christmas. Thank you. This is. <laughs> I, I, I could do this all day. Um, so thank you and hi to everybody in Sweden and Isle of Malta and Great Britain and France and everybody else who's tuning in to this insanity. Stay safe, stay in your house, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands again. Get some of Ma's like Good Lies soap, maybe some lemon verbena, I don't know, and really give them a good scrub. And everyone, um, take care of each other and stay safe. Bye, see you tomorrow, it'll be Christmas, yeah.